All right, so Matthew chapter 26 is where we're going to be this morning. Matthew chapter 26. Our God is faithful. I love that song. He is faithful. Matthew chapter 26. And we are going to be reading about Jesus at the end of his life this morning. If you will stand with me as we read from verses 36 down to verse 46. Again, Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 36. It says here, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take you rest. Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please meet with us now. Please just help me to articulate the truth, the words that you would have this morning in a way that would please you. Help me to accurately explain your word as I seek to preach it to your people. Please be with each one here this morning, Lord. Help their eyes and their ears to be open and attentive to that which you have. Help their hearts to be ready to receive it, Lord God, and help us to go away. I changed people better for you. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever considered this question? What is the most important thing you do every day? Pick one thing in your life right now. What is the most important thing you do every day? What is vital, vitally important in your life? I look around here and I see some teenage boys, and I think the first thing that comes to their mind is eat. At least when I was a teenage boy, that was the first thing. If I got to do one thing every day, it was eat. And even now, I consider eating vitally important every single day. Um, I am a person that I like to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it doesn't matter if breakfast isn't until 11 o'clock. We can still have lunch at noon. That's fine. And then we'll have dinner at 5. And if you need to, if you need to have like second dinner, I am all about that. I've tried to talk my wife into this, but she has refused me thus far. But having dinner at 5 and then having dinner again at like 9, like that would be wonderful. I like, I'm Baptist, okay? There's a reason I'm Baptist. It's because we don't preach about gluttony here. Um, at least it's not too often that you hear Baptist churches do that. Uh, you think about other, per there's going to be the sarcastic person in the room. And I know the person, um, a lady from a former church, and her interesting answer would have been breathe. Like what was vitally important to you today? She would have said breathing. Like, and she would have said it under her breath right there in the middle of the auditorium. And everybody around her would have been laughing because that's just who she is. Um, and there's probably somebody here today who has thought that same thing. What's the most important thing you do every day? Somebody in here is like, breathe. Um, uh, others may have various things, right? Go to school, perhaps go to work, earn a living, work on my relationship, be a better husband, be a better wife, be a husband, be a wife, make dinner for my husband. I mean, that's perfectly, maybe not the best answer, but I'd be okay with that answer, I suppose. Um, there's people who think uh, studying, studying is vitally important every day, and it is. We need to learn educationally. We need to grow. Some people may think their hobby. Some people you know, focus on every day I need to be a better, better golfer or a better runner or a better artist or a better musician or what is it? It's really an interesting question to consider. What is the most important thing you do every day of your life? Our days, they consist of much. I mean, there's much action. The things we do every day are legion. We do things simply to survive, right? Like I said, we eat, although probably don't need to eat as much as we do to survive. <laughs> we do things like bathe, and that is vitally important. Please do that, especially if you're a junior high boy. It's okay to bathe. Don't be afraid of the shower. We do things relationally. We need to work on our marriages. We need to work on being better parents. We need to be, work on being better children. 
We have to think about providing for our families, providing income. We have entertainment. We all enjoy doing things. We have a spiritual walk. We have mental well-being. And there's all kinds of things we consider day in and day out. And now you think about our lives in the midst of everything going on. There's a God. He's there. He's right there. We know He is everywhere present at all times. We've been studying through the attributes of God on Wednesday nights. If you haven't been here or been observing those, I would encourage you to go back and watch those recordings. I was going to say those videos. We don't do videos anymore. There's no VHSs anymore. It's very sad. We just bought a new house. I think I told you I went in the attic and I found a VHS player. I was like, what? I don't have any tapes anymore, but I was very excited about that. And everybody else, all the younger generations, like, what's a VHS? Anyway, you don't need to worry about that right now. But you think about all the things we go through in life each and every day, and God's there. He's right there in the middle of it. And we, we have these various things happening, and yet it's like we don't even consider that God is there oftentimes until catastrophe hits. We especially see this in the world outside of the church. People can be atheists, they can be all-out God-haters, they can deny God in every way, shape, or form, but then a hurricane hits and all of a sudden we hear people praying that we're like, I didn't even know you knew what the word God was. And all of a sudden people are praying, right? We, we have um, all sorts of situations that we can think of where something catastrophic has happened and people who've refused God for years are all of a sudden turning to Him. To me, it's fascinating because for us, if we trust him in the way that we say we do, why do we only turn to him in such sincere ways in the most troubling of times? And we think about prayer now, and prayer is going to be the topic of the day. Um, why don't we look at him for every single facet of our life instead of the most important? I think about um, football. We'll use an analogy for Brother McCoy right now. If you had a football team with the greatest quarterback in history on your football team, we will call him Tom Brady um, because, well, he's the GOAT. It just is what it is, okay? Like, I'm a Colts fan, and I hated him for years when he was at the Patriots. When he went to Tampa Bay, I was okay with him. Now that he's retired, I'm really okay with him, okay? Um, but now we think of the Denver Broncos. Brother McCoy's not even in here. I'm just going to pick on him anyway. And, and his team, they picked up a new quarterback. They got Russell Wilson, a very strong first name. I appreciate uh, Russell Wilson there. He's got to be an excellent quarterback. Um, but, but say they picked up Tom Brady in his prime, and he's going to go to Denver. And Denver has been mediocre at best since they won a Super Bowl with Peyton Manning, who was at his worst at the time. Um, and so... It was a really bad version of Peyton Manning if you watched the NFL. And so we have the Broncos, and they want to win a championship. And so they bring in Tom Brady on their football team, who, again, if you're not a sports person, just greatest quarterback ever. Really is. I hate to admit it, but it's true. But say they also have a quarterback like Rex Grossman. Raise your hand if you remember Rex Grossman. Do we have anybody? We got a few people in here. So Rex Grossman was the quarterback the Colts played against with Peyton Manning when they won their Super Bowl against the Chicago Bears. And Rex Grossman was the most mediocre quarterback that's ever played in the NFL. Um, like, you know, there, there's like those great guys and there's those guys that are atrocious. Well, Rex Grossman is the definition of average, okay? I mean, he was a game manager, and he was definitely okay. Um, he got him to a Super Bowl, he just couldn't win it. And so, you think of Rex Grossman, and now, say that the Broncos, they pick up mediocre quarterback Rex Grossman and Tom Brady. And so, what they decide to do is, they go out, it's not really football season upon us quite yet, we got a few months, but say the first week of the season, they go out, and they're like, we're going to start our best, or we're going to start our quarterback, Rex Grossman. And so week one, they go out there and they start Rex Grossman and he plays until, you know, middle of the third quarter when they are down by 40 and they're like, all right, let's bring in Tom Brady and see if we can pull off a win. And so Tom Brady comes in and he pulls off a win and they're like, yeah. So they go to week two and what do they do? They put Rex Grossman out there. Let's start Rex Grossman, see what he can do. And so Rex Grossman, he goes, he plays his heart out and in the fourth quarter, they're down by 30. Well, what are we going to do now? Let's put in Tom Brady. Let's see what he can do. He goes out there. And, and he, he loses the game. They lose by two points. They go out there week number three, and they put out Rex Grossman. And, and everybody else is thinking, why do they keep putting out this guy? They just keep losing. And at the very end, it's like, well, maybe Tom Brady can bail us out of this. Or maybe you have a house, and you live in this house, and you love this house, and you're neighbors with Chip and Joanna Gaines. This is a very Texas reference. Every, who here has heard of, of Chip and Joanna Gaines? 
I got a few more on this example. Some, still some hands you have not. Chip and Joanna Gaines are a, I mean, they claim to be a Christian couple, and they are on, I believe, HGTV, and they fix up houses, and they make them look beautiful, and they help people out. I don't know that they help them. They charge lots of money, and they make lots of money. That's what they do. Um, but anyway, they make beautiful houses, and they sell all kinds of things up the road from us here, and they are like millionaires, billionaires, trillionaires. I don't know what they are. They're hundredaires, something. So they got money, right? But anyway, say you live next door to these people who can like literally fix anything. You watch their show, and they walk into like a broke-down barn, and then all of a sudden, it's a it grows from a barn to a barn dominium, which is the size of like two football fields, and it has like an elevator and a fire fire escape pole running down the middle. I don't know. It's incredible. They do stuff that you're like, who thought of this and why did you do this? And it's beautiful and it looks good together and it's really cool. And so you live next to them and they're like, hey, anytime you need help, neighbor, we'll help you. You know, if you need some help remodeling, you need whatever, we'll go over there and help you. And so you're like, okay, that's awesome. But you have this kitchen remodel you want to do and you're like, I don't need their help. Like, if they can do it, I can do it. Plus, if I ask them, they're going to think I'm some sort of loser. So I'm just going to like build this awesome dream kitchen myself. And so you do what they do at the beginning of the show is you put on your safety goggles and you get your sledgehammer, right? And you, you got to demolish it. Demolition's the fun part. That's what Chip says. I've watched the show like three times. I don't know. I haven't even seen it that much. Maybe a few more than that. We've, we've watched it a couple times. Like we don't have cable. So like when we're at somebody's house that does and it's on and we watch it or when I'm at um, Great Clips getting my hair cut. I don't go to Great Clips. Where do I go? Sports Clips. And, and then there's, you know, whatever. I, I almost never watch it, but I know that Chuck loves to destroy stuff. He gets out, Chip, Chip, it, that's, he's got a name, it's Chip. I got corrected from the floor. Thank you, why? We'll be having to talk about that later. And so, um, you got, so, so he gets out a sledgehammer and he starts welling on stuff. Like, that's his favorite part. He, he, he hits it and then he always gives it to the homeowner and the homeowner is always like, And he's like, be a man. And you're like, you're not allowed to say that on TV anymore. And he's like, I said it. Be a man and hit it. And he takes out that hammer and he, he wells something. Then he gives it to the homeowner and they hit it a little harder. He's like, closer. And then they, anyway, so they start busting stuff down. So you're like, I'm going to do this. I, got, I can remodel that house. I got a sledgehammer. I mean, at least I'm going to go down to Lowe's and buy one for $26.99. And so you go down and you buy one and you get the safety goggles. Why? Because they always wear safety goggles because they're on TV. But the rest of us in real life... Like 30% of us might wear safety goggles. The rest of us are like, ah, they're in the other room and I forgot them. I'm not going to get them. And so we get out our sledgehammer and we're like, I'm going to hit something. So we start well and you start knocking down. I want an open, I want an open design because that's what everybody wants because that's all the hip stuff. So like there's a wall between my kitchen and my living room. I'm going to knock down the wall. This is going to be awesome. So I take down my sledgehammer and I'm just knit welling on it. Like I don't know what's going to happen. I don't even know what load bearing means. And we knock it down and all of a sudden we see... And we bell out just in time, and we go over, and we're like, somebody opens the door, you're like, uh, Joanna, is Chip home? Why? Because we're not going to admit this to a lady, right? We're going to wait for the man to come there. Uh, can I talk to you outside for a minute? I was doing a remodel project, and uh, I kind of, um, well, my house was falling. Could you help me now? <laughs> and, and like, at the last minute, we're like, oh, I can do something desperate to help me. And you think about those things, and they're absolutely ridiculous, and yet, I wonder how often this is our approach to God. We're like, I got life. Right? I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to go here and I have this to do and I have a relationship and I have children to raise and I have a job to do. And, I... and when things get bad enough, I'll ask God to bail me out. I feel like very often it's not just what we consider the unspiritual world or the world around us. I think in churches a lot of times we don't take things to God in quite the way that we should. If he's a God that can help in the midst of the horrible, it's a hurricane's come through and God, please protect my family wherever they are. If I can trust him to protect my family, can I not trust him to help me to make the right decision at work this morning before I make a mess of it? Can I not help trust him to help me to do my job right before I get fired and have to ask him to help me to find a new job? Can I not pray and ask him for wisdom before I knock down a load-bearing wall? <laughs> yeah. You get the point. We, we got to prioritize prayer in our life to a way that we may not. And so this morning, as we approach the, the topic of prayer, I'm going to ask you this. Do you seek God's help in every part, in every facet, in every little nuance of your life? Or do you only invite him along when you think you need him? God's full power. I mean, think about this. God's full power, the omnipotent God, the God who speaks and things come into existence from nothing. His full power is at our disposal at all times. Like he's able 
and he's willing and he wants to help us. But he also wants us to ask. And so I believe the most important thing we do every day is pray. If prayer carries with it the potential for God to move his hand on your behalf, I believe prayer is the most important thing you can do every day. And in our text this morning, I believe we see this. In our text, we have Jesus. He's facing the final hours of his life. He was ready to die as that was the Father's will. He was going to endure great physical pain. He's going to be betrayed by one of his 12 closest apostles. The 11 others are going to run away from him and flee. He's going to be tried. He's going to be tormented. He's going to be executed. And not only that, he's going to take the sins of the full world upon him. And now Jesus, knowing all of this, enters into the garden at Gethsemane, knowing what he's about to face. And in the midst of all this, with only a few hours left of freedom, and probably 24 hours until he is executed, Jesus, knowing all of this and all of the other things that could be done in life, stops and prays. Prayer was important to Jesus. Look at verse 40 with me again in our text. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 40, it says this, And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Look what Jesus says again. Could ye not watch with me one hour? It seems incredulous to Jesus that the disciples could not pray with him for an hour. I wonder what most of us think about when we hear that Jesus prayed for an hour. 60 minutes, he prayed for an hour. Jesus thought it was ridiculous that the apostles couldn't. What, can, could you not watch with me for an hour? It was just an hour. It was a short little prayer. It was an hour. Could you not pray with me for an hour? And you and I hear a short little prayer was an hour. We're like, an hour? What would I do for an hour? You talk to God. It's, it's interesting when you think about this. I think it highlights the importance of prayer to Jesus when we think about it like this. Imagine you do something today, tonight, tomorrow with someone you love, right? You go out with your friends or you take your girlfriend or boyfriend on a date or you do whatever. It's incredible how quickly time passes. My wife and I, we try to set aside a few days a week with our children. We're like, I'm going to be done with work at this time. And she's like, I'm going to be done with my work at this time. And then we're going to get together and we're going to spend a few hours in family time. And every time we do that, as soon as we start, it seems like it's over. You guys share this experience, or you, you remember back when you used to date, if you were married, or you are dating right now, you go out on that date, and it's like, as soon as you took her out, like it was over. Where did the time go? You enjoy it, you enjoy it so much because that person is so important to you, and it makes the time just fly by. And with Jesus, that was his time with the Father. He prayed, and he's like, could you not pray for an hour? Like, it was just like that. It was over. I was praying to him, and like, I just came to check on you guys, see what you guys were doing, see if you had any questions, see if I could help you, direct you in prayer, and you're asleep. Is that what prayer's like to you? Or does prayer drag on? Because the importance of the Father to us indicates the importance of prayer to us because it makes prayer easier and seem like it passes. So we see... I guess, I don't know if it's a sub-point or what, but you see that prayer is important to Jesus because of how fast the time passed. Because that was the important relationship. You see, it's important to him also because of how he prays. Within 24 hours, again, Jesus is going to suffer the most cruel form of death that the Roman government could come up with. Again, he would lose all his friends. They would abandon him. He's going to have to tell his mother to go to John to care for her. On top of it all, it's triggered by one of the 12 people closest in his life. And there is so little time remaining, and yet Jesus prays. And it's not a short prayer. Remember, he prays for an hour, and I love that. But then you go to verse um, 42, and it says this, He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may, pass, it may not pass from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Notice here, the disciples, they were to pray with him. They were to pray for him. They were to watch and pray with him. 
and they were to do it for their own sinful souls. And our, our, our focus is not on them this morning. It's just on the prayers of Jesus. Jesus had prayed for an hour, and they could only stay awake long enough to see a short portion of the prayer. It's very fascinating to me. We see that he prayed for an hour, and all they seem to remember is, oh, Father, oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as that will. And then he goes to his disciples, and they're asleep in verse 40. And in verse 41, he says, watch and pray. And in verse 42, they're asleep again. The disciples are with him, but they can't stay awake and watch. He finds them sleeping. He said a few words to them, and then he goes and he prays again. He can't make them pray. He can't make them focus on it. So he's praying. He's doing what he can. But we see prayer is not that important to them, but it's extremely important to him. If you were to turn over to Mark 14, you don't have to turn there with me, but it's a parallel passage. And verse 39, it says, and again, he went away, this is the second time, and prayed and spake the same words. And so we get the impression that Prayer is important to Jesus. He's praying for an hour. He goes to them and says, look, can you guys not just pray with me? Do you not understand the importance of prayer? He goes back to prayer. It says, and he said the same thing again, meaning he likely prayed for another hour. And then we get to our text again in Matthew in chapter 26 and verse 43. And it says, and he came and found them asleep again. So now they're asleep another time for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time saying, the same word. So again, we very likely have Jesus praying for a third hour. Jesus doesn't have much time left, and yet he spends it praying. They, Jesus, he finds his disciples asleep. He, he goes away and says, okay, this is important to me. I'm going to pray. They drift back to sleep. All they can tell us that he prayed is basically that one to two sentences that it tells us that we find here in Matthew and in Mark. It's interesting, right? With the short time that Jesus had left after the Last Supper, he, spends to have spent, he seems to have spent all of his free time in prayer. He has three hours left. He didn't spend it with his mother. He didn't spend it with all of his friends. He did not even spend it with all of his apostles, except for three that he brought with them and said, I want you to stay with me while I pray. And even then, while he's with them, he prays for hour after hour after hour. With all of his free time. Most of us right now, if you were told you have three hours left to live, what would you do? How would you handle that time? How would you spend that time? What would you do with those three hours? Well, I would make financial arrangements for my wife so that she can live after I'm gone. Or I would spend my time with my family and my friends and those closest to me. Or I would go to the people that I've wronged in life and apologize to them. And yet Jesus, prayer was the most important thing he could do. Jesus didn't make light of the matter, right? He didn't make light of any of these things. He did take his three friends with him and he said, pray with me. Watch with me. He wanted to be with them, but the most important thing in his life was the Father. And even in that last day of his life, prayer was the most important to him. It's expressed in the Bible over and over again. Matthew 14 and verse 23 says, And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And Mark 6, 46, And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And Mark 1 and verse 35, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And it came to pass in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And you think about Jesus's life. He has a lot going on in life. Right? He is walking for miles each day. He is going and he is preaching and he is teaching and he's feeding 5,000 and he's feeding 4,000 and he's healing people and he's teaching in the synagogues and he's being threatened and he's being accused and he's taking his apostles all across the country one way to teach them an example and then he's taking them somewhere else and saying this and then he's taking them somewhere else and he's doing much and yet every day, and it doesn't tell us every time he did something he prayed, but we get the idea that he always made time to pray. And not a short amount, a great while before the morning he goes out and he prays. Or he prays all through the night. Prayer was greatly important to Jesus. 
So much so that he wasn't going to let anything stop it. No, that doesn't mean he had to add a regiment of time. He prayed every morning at 4.30. No, we see a schedule change here for Jesus from time to time. Sometimes it's late at night. Sometimes it's early in the morning. Sometimes it's whenever. He schedules the time to pray each day, though. He makes sure he has time to pray each day. He spends time in prayer each and every day. And as we read about these things, we read about Jesus, the one to whom we are to conform. I wholeheartedly believe that the most important thing he did every single day was pray. It's the thing that we see him doing constantly and repeatedly. Now we read in our text about the last moments of Jesus' life, and he could have said, I lived a sinless life, because he did, right? He doesn't have anybody he needs to apologize to. There's no one he needs to go to in these last few hours. He could have said, I'm ready to die for my friends. I'm ready to die for the world. Let me just spend a few minutes with Peter, James, and John. Let me hang out with the 12 apostles and teach them a few more points. But seemingly, with three hours of freedom left, Jesus spent them all on praying, demonstrating that it's not just prayer in times of desperation that matter. It's prayer all the time that matters. Prayer was the priority. Prayer was the most important thing in his life. He had feelings and he had relationships and he had things he could be doing and yet he prayed. Prayer was the most important thing. Prayer is the most important thing we can do every day. As you think about this assertion, you may ask why prayer is the most important thing and uh, two simple points I suppose this morning. And the first one is this, there's potential in prayer. There is potential in prayer. Jesus had known for years that he was the son of God and he had told the apostles repeatedly, I'm going to, be die, I'm going to die, I'm going to be lifted up, I'm going to be in several different ways. He's going to be taken and he is going to be executed. And Jesus knew that's why he was here. He knew he was born to die for the sins of men. And yet in verse 39 of our text again, it says, and he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it be possible Let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. All right, remember this. Jesus is 100% God, but he's also 100% man. And as a man here, he is recognizing the incomprehensible potential in prayer. As God, Jesus knew he had to die. He knew it's what must be done. He knew he would do it. And yet as man, he recognizes the potential mercy, the potential grace, and the potential power of God and says, I'm going to ask him because he's God. Because there is no limit to the potential of what God can do. And for every human, this is a wonderful truth. God in heaven is holy and altogether above us being in his presence. I'm unworthy ever to darken the door of heaven. I'm unworthy to be in God's presence in any way, shape, or form. He is perfect and sinless and righteous and holy, and I'm not. I'm vile and filthy and a sinner. In Matthew in chapter 19, um, if you want to turn over there, a text that switches directions, I suppose, just a little bit. In verses 23 to verse 26, it says this, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard this, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So Jesus here, he says it's hard for the rich to be saved. It's it's hard for those who have a lot to be saved. And I think of our country, and I think this applies to our country pretty universally. Uh, We may not think of ourselves as rich, but we really are when we look around the world. We think about the poorest people in our country, and our country makes a way for them to survive. We have programs that are designed to provide income. They provide housing. They provide cell phones. We provide insurance. People are pouring into our country because our poor look pretty rich compared to most countries. 
It's interesting, I worked for, my dad retired from CSX, the railroad. I worked there for about a year, but my wife was pregnant and we had Peyton and I decided, I was an engineer on a railroad, um, which was an interesting thing. Uh, for those of you who don't know that, I don't know that I put that on my resume. But for about nine months, I was a uh, engineer on the railroad. And I would go out and walk the tracks and do my thing, right? Like I, I had to go and check it all out. I, I Anyway, it was... One of those jobs that you, whatever. So anyway, I, I, I didn't drive the train. I was the man who, like, I would say the signs, and I had to, like, build the train. I'd bring the train back and send it forward and go and pull off into offshoots and whatever. And anyway, as you do it, you have to train, and you start going further and further out. And we had our child, and um, I didn't really want to maintain that lifestyle because I would be missing much of her life. Um, but I say all that to say because one of the fascinating things that I think my father can attest to is this. There's a lot of people who choose to be hobos. Like, they're very wealthy and they just say, I'm going to quit life and I'm going to live on the back of a train and follow it from place to place as it goes. Pretty right, Dad? <laughs> it's weird. Like The first time I'm walking a train and I'm going back and I look over and, and I see, and we, we, they take you to Choo Choo U. That's what it's called, right? That's not the real name of it, but it, that's what we affectionately call it. And, and they teach you how to be a railroader. And they tell you in class, okay, you're going to come into hobos. These are people who live on trains. Most of them aren't harmful. Some of them are. And they tell you all about it. But anyway, you're walking the first train one day and you're like, I go back to like three cars and on the back of uh, whatever kind of car it was, all of a sudden there's a sleeping bag and a hat and a bag, but no man. And I'm like, where's the man? You know what I mean? Like, you're, is he going to attack me? What, I, what's going on? I, I say all that simply to say this. Are, these people aren't in want for the most part. And if they are, it's because they choose to be because there's, I mean, if you've looked at the job shortage, there's jobs to be had in our country. And a lot of people just don't want any responsibility. And so it looks pretty good in our country to be poor. I know no, nobody wants to be poor, but I'm just saying as a whole, as a country, we're rich. And Jesus is saying this, it's hard for you to be saved. It's hard because we are so very entitled. It's hard because when you have so much wealth, you can say, I can get through this. It's hard because it's like we don't know what it's like to have to ask for help. We've never had to rely on somebody else to survive. We've never had to go to our government and beg food from them, right? We, we're not like they do in other countries. We don't have to rely on foreign missionaries coming in and going and lining up and saying, can I just have a little bit of food? They, people in a lot of foreign countries know, perhaps find an easier time relying on God because they're used to relying on other people, whereas we're rich. We, we are not at the top of the food chain, perhaps financially, but still, if I have a problem, I can solve a lot of my own problems. And so Jesus is saying, because of that, it's hard for a lot of people to look to God. It's hard for them to get saved because they can see their own way out. They've provided food for themselves. They've provided houses for themselves. They've provided raiment for themselves. They've earned the things they got, and they think they can rely on themselves. And Jesus says it's hard for people to be saved. And the disciples say, well, this is a hard saying. And then Jesus says, well, with men, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I think about that, and then I think about John 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at that last day. It's hard, but there's potential there. It's hard for people to be saved, but that doesn't mean we can't be saved. Because God loves us, and God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. He says, I am here. He's, he sends a way of drawing us into us. Saying, come to me, find me, I'm available, I have salvation to offer you. Even though you're not used to looking for it, I still want you. Begging, pleading with people to be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He says, I love you so much. I want you, I desire to have you, I desire you to be saved. And we see that there's potential in prayer. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's done everything to make salvation possible, but what's he say we have to do? We have to believe and then we have to call upon him. We have to pray. And so we see potential in prayer from a very basic standpoint. Salvation is available to all. Escaping our sins, having a relationship with God, having an eternity in heaven is available to everyone in here and everyone in the world, but it's only potential until we believe 
and we pray and ask him to save us. It's just potential. For you and me, for the believer in here, for those who have already done this, God's power in prayer is not limited to what he will do for us in salvation. It's unlimited potential. I, I love reading, thinking about this verse again. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as I will. And frequently, we focus on the second half of this prayer. And yes, we need to pray all things in the will of God. But at the first, he says, as Jesus, the Son of God, again, I believe as a man right now, recognizing the full potential, says, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus is saying, you're God. I recognize the potential. Is there a way around this? And we, we see at, from our perspective this very fact. God's power is not limited. It's open to everything. He has unlimited power. He can do anything. The potential is without end. John 14, 14. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Anything. Jesus makes this promise. If we ask anything in his name, he will do it. Then we... Think about James in 4 and verses 2 and 3. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, and ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask a mist that ye may consume it upon your lust. And there's times in our lives where we're not receiving anything from God because we're asking inappropriately. We are lusting after things, they are, we are seeking things that we ought not, and we're not going to get those things, but... The point that he's primarily making here is that you are not receiving because you are not asking. And I fear that's many Christians today. There's unlimited power there. There's unlimited ability for God to help in every single facet and aspect of your life. And yet we don't have his power on our lives in every part of our lives. We don't have the full goodness of God. We don't have his full mercy, his full grace, his full blessings because we don't ask. We have not because we ask not. We have these finite temporal lives and we want much. And so we set off to work and we labor to get it all. And yet in the book of James, he says, you're missing it. Yeah, yeah. There's more. And you're not getting it because you're not asking for it. And yet Jesus, knowing there was no way around it, says, Father, if it's possible, will you let this cup pass from me? And knowing it's not possible as God, but as man, he says, he's done it all. He can do anything. And if Jesus prayed this, there must be potential. Potential for God to do anything. So the prayer is important because there's unlimited potential. The second thing is, prayer is important because there's power in prayer. You think about this and perhaps you think, but God didn't deliver Jesus from this death. Well, we know that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. It was divinely ordained that the will of God was that Jesus Christ would die on the cross for our sins, and Jesus did so willingly. Without the blood of Jesus, there would be no forgiveness of sins. It was God's plan. It was the way, the only way. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have done it. So then why did he pray? If you look over to Luke in chapter 22 with me, and Luke in chapter 22, again, another parallel account of what is going on here, it, it says much of the same thing, but as you get down to verse 43, there's one little snippet here that's not included in Matthew or Mark. In verse 43, well, go to verse 42 again. It says, saying, Father, if thou will, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And here's God's answer. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. There appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. In our text, Jesus is asking for this cup to pass, if there's another way, he loves the world. He wants to give himself for it. He loves his apostles. He loves his mother. He loves his family. He is a man, he, but he still loves the Father supremely. And so he's going to God saying, I believe as a man, God, th th this is me. I I've lived a perfect sinless life. I, I know he understands that he is God at this point. And he's praying and he's talking to the Father and he's saying, God, is there another way? And God says, no but he provides strength for the journey. He provides not what Jesus wants, but what Jesus needs. God sends an angel 
to provide enough strength to get through the remaining hours. He says, you're asking me for help. I want to do something to help you. I'm going to send an angel and I'm going to encourage you. That way when Judas betrays you, you can stand. That way when you stand before the Sanhedrin, you can stand. That way when you are facing Pilate in the judgment hall, you're going to remember this encouragement. When you stand in front of Herod, you're going to remember this. When you come back and you're before Pilate again, he's just giving him what he needs to get through. And sometimes we're pleading with God and we're asking God, telling him what we think we need, but God says, that's not what you need. I have what you need. And what he provides for us is his power, though it may not be in the way that we thought. God has the power to help in any situation. It doesn't mean it's always going to be just like we want it to be, but his power has no bounds. There's not just potential in prayer. There's great power in prayer. Power that is recognized through prayer. Power that's recognized when we pray as Jesus prayed, when prayer becomes the most important thing in our day. In the Bible, we see example after example of this. We see people going to Jesus. Jesus, will you heal my hand? He heals his hand. Will you give me sight? He gives them sight. Will you help me to hear? He makes them hear. They ask, and because they ask, they receive. And you think about this and the power of God, and it's truly without limit. God has not promised to give you everything you want, but he's promised to help you. He's promised to give you what you need. He's promised to be there for you. I think sometimes we're intimidated and fearful of not hearing from God the way we want, so we don't pray like we should. That makes sense. We're afraid to pray for big things because if we don't get them, it's like, maybe God's not real. A thought that we don't ever want to say out loud, but perhaps one that comes to our minds. But I love Romans 8.26. It should encourage us all in this regard. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Just pray. Sometimes we don't know how to pray the way we should. And God says, if you will just pray, you have the Holy Spirit in you, and he's taking your prayers, and he is making intercessions with groanings for the things that we should be praying for. And so while I may be asking, if I am asking sincerely, if I am asking, trying to do what I know God wants, then the Holy Spirit is there making intercessions for us. I love that. God wants to help you. And so much so that when we are not smart enough to ask in the right way, he says, I'll help you to ask me in the right way. He put the Holy Spirit inside of you to guide you, to help you, to make intercessions for you, groaning on your behalf, because we know not what we should pray for. And so he helps us. He strengthens us. 1 John 5, 15, and if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. There's power in prayer. He said, if you ask it, I will provide it. Sometimes your, your ask is going to be amiss, but I'm still going to strengthen you. I'm still going to provide power for you. I'm still going to provide the thing that you need, even though it may not be exactly as you wanted it or expected, I'm going to provide it. Have you ever experienced this power in prayer? Have you ever felt the power of God in prayer? I think in 2016 is probably the um, biggest prayer I've ever had answered, perhaps. I don't know. I've had several. I, I love sharing with people, not to brag on my prayer life, because my prayer life is nothing, but just to see the power of God. In 2016, I had a 2001 Sierra, a GMC Sierra 2500 with 270,000 miles on it. It was a blue truck. It was somewhat pretty if you stood far away from it. You got too close, you saw a lot of rust, and you saw some oil dripping underneath of it. Um, And it it wasn't the greatest truck in the world, but it did me okay. And I had just left the practice of law, and I became a youth pastor, and this was the truck that I had. Um, And I knew that it was going to run out of juice, so to speak. It wasn't going to last forever. So I began um, for about a year just praying, God, will you give me a new truck? And I wasn't asking for a different truck. I said, God, will you give me a new truck? I want a brand new truck. I want it to have four doors. I want it to have four-wheel drive. And I want it to be like the crew cab size, like a full-size truck with four doors, four-wheel drive, brand new. And I prayed for it. 
and I prayed for it, and I prayed for it, and I prayed for it, and I prayed for it for about a year because I knew I was going to need a different truck, and I knew that I couldn't afford one. Uh, trucks are expensive, and I wanted a new one. I probably didn't need a new one, but I asked for a new one. God, please give me a new truck. Please give me a new And every morning, as part of my prayers, I would be part of it. God, please give me this new truck. And um, I don't know, not too long after that, my, uh, well, in the middle of that, we uh, went on a vacation, and my wife and I and our children and my parents, and we hooked up our campers, right? I had a 2006 camper that was the same size as this one, only it had an all-wood frame, and it was about twice as heavy. Um, I think it was 10,700 pounds. And so I got my 2001 with 270,000 miles on it, and we decide we're going to go from Indiana. I think we were going to South Carolina that time. And we get to about Kentucky in the mountains there, I believe, uh, around southern Kentucky, and all of a sudden, I get this... Tap, 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 tap. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> what are we going to do? We're only in Kentucky. We got a lot of driving left to do. So I call my dad, and we pull over a station, and we're fooling with it. And we, I think, drained the oil, and we filled it with Slick 50, if I remember right. It's basically what we did. Um, and we uh, did everything we could do. We were quitting on vacation. I am no quitter. We were going on to have fun, and it was fun. Um, and, but anyway, we, we continued driving that truck all the way down there. Praying, Lord, please give me a new truck. This is getting bad now. Um, I knew I couldn't afford a new truck. That truck, it was burning as much oil as um, I was gasoline almost, I feel like. It was like every time you stop, you got to add some in it. It was leaking it. It was burning it. And it ended up with an exhaust leak. It had all kinds of wonderful problems. It was great. But about a week before, and this was about a year after I started praying, about a week before we took this trip, I got a call from somebody that I did legal work for like six years before that. Um, and he said, hey, Russell. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I got a check for you, or I'm going to have a check for you. I'm like, what? He's like, a case you worked on a long time ago. He's like, we finally got through a bunch of stuff that would bore you guys to death. But anyway, he, he goes, I, I'm going to send you a check. I'm like, you paid me for all the work. Like, I got paid hourly very well to do all the work. I was like, you don't owe me anything. He's like, yeah, but we won a uh, attorney's fee award. I'm like, well, that's interesting. He's like, I know you haven't been on the case, but I want to pay you for all the hours you did. I'm like, oh, awesome. That'd be wonderful. What am I going to get? A couple thousand dollars? This will be great. And so I'm like, I didn't really think much about it, but I can't remember if we were on vacation when I got the call back or if it was right after vacation. But I get a call from him and he's like, hey, Russell. I'm like, yeah. He's like, uh, I got a check for you. I'm thinking, Lord, are you answering my prayer right now? He's like, how much for? And he told me the amount. And it was enough to buy any truck I wanted, fully loaded in any way I wanted. Like brand new. I'm like, Lord, what? I did this legal work for many years before. I was paid hourly. He literally owed me nothing. And yet I'm praying for this truck and praying for this truck and praying for this truck. And it's like, God, to say to me, I am providing you the truck right now, made sure to wait until my truck broke down before he said, this is the money. That way you don't conflate these two issues in your head and you're asking me for a new truck later on. Like the truck was broke and I got the call. Here's the money. Here's the broke truck. Go buy yourself a new truck. That's an answer to prayer. I mean, you see God's power in it all. I, I, I think of all the prayers that I prayed, and that's one of the ones that, like, when I think of God's power, it's like, wow. He could have given me nothing. He could have given me that amount at any time. But the way he worked it out, work done many years before, all of a sudden, a check. So literally, I, I walked in, said, this is the truck I want, and I wrote them a check. I've never wrote that big of a check before or since. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He gave me the money to write a check for a new truck. And I say all of this just to say this. There's power in prayer. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you've seen it, but if you haven't seen it, you're missing out. Prayer should be the most important thing in our lives because there is great potential, but it's not just potential, it's great power. If you don't have that power in your life, you're missing out. And so I guess in conclusion this morning, I ask you this. What's the most important thing in your life? What's the most important thing you do every day? If it's not prayer, your priorities are out of the line. Prayer should be the most important thing you do every day. I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes this morning. God's provided so much for us. He's made so much available. Great power, great potential, and yet he says, you have not because you ask not. Are you asking God in prayer today the way that he wants you to? He is your father as he sits in heaven above, desiring to do things for you, just wants you to come to him and ask. Are you asking? If not, I would encourage you to change your prayer life. 
Make it a priority. Make it the most important thing you do each day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day you've given us. We ask now that you would just help us to perceive the things that you would have us to from this message. Help us to make you a priority and prayer to you a priority each day in a way that perhaps we have not. Help us to seek your power, Lord, because we know in you there is great potential, but it's not just potential, Lord. Lord, you make things available to us, and then you say, if we will just ask, you will give it. If we ask anything in Jesus' name, you will do it. Lord, I ask now in Jesus' name that you would meet with us in this church and help us to become more of the Christians you would have us to be. Meet with us in this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.